the show. Start the show. Start the show. Start the show and then get off the property. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Victoria Leva. Thanks for tuning in tonight. So Say We All is a performing arts and literary nonprofit organization here in San Diego. Our mission is to tell people stories and to help them tell them the best that they can. We do this through publishing, <laughs> performing, and education. I first got involved with VAMP about a year and a half ago. I was dating someone who was in a cult and I had a lot to say. Shout out to my ex-boyfriend. And I didn't really know where to go or who to tell. <laughs> Thankfully VAMP, came into my life. And now, five performances later, here I am producing for you. The beautiful thing about So Say We All is our community. Coaches, performers, audience, we're all one thing together, especially during these hard times. And we're excited to bring you stories and to hear from you too. The arts in San Diego make it even more special to live in San Diego. <laughs> um, it makes it a better place to live in. And we believe that it makes the arts make people feel a little less lonely and a little less crazy right now. So, in Whistle Stop, where we usually are, we like to turn to everyone and say, hello, and how are you? But since we're all at home right now, this is the best we can do. So in lieu of turning to a stranger, turn to whatever's closest to you, a person, cat, dog, your own beautiful reflection in the mirror, and just say, hi, how are you? It feels kind of good, doesn't it? <laughs> you also probably wonder how VAMP submissions work. So first, you submit to a blind panel of judges. They'll pick some pieces, Next, they'll pair up with performance and writing coaches. And then from there, there is going to be group critiques and lots of one-on-one -on -one work. And then you could be on the stage, just like these performers tonight. So please do us a favor. Write to us. Do what you can. We love to hear from people in the community. Our performers tonight are Leon Deckelbaum, Lynn Cooper, Kevin Manley, Tim West, Brent Hanafy, Ariana Remmel, and Ariana Krieger. It is a regular practice in theater when the theater is dark, unoccupied by audiences, as theaters are now, to leave some small illumination in the venue called a ghost light. If you go into most theaters, if you went into them, even today, you'd find in the black the glow of a naked low watt soft white or dull yellow bulb from a sturdy wireframe basket to protect from mischance, mounted atop an upright pipe fixed to a metal plate on wobbly casters, trailing a dusty extension cord from center stage off into the dark to an outlet somewhere in the wings. A kind of industrial strength nightlight. The ghost light keeps the first person into the darkened auditorium from stubbing their toes, or worse, should they need to retrieve or repair or rehearse something off hours when the venue is unoccupied, as now, or on what we call dark nights. Theater folk, though, like to say the ghost light is for the spirits of the dead, who are attracted by the occasional live event punctuated by long periods of peaceful contemplation alone in the dark. The theater in Old Town, home to a series of companies in the last half century, has a ghost in the rafters, what we call the grid. He goes by Charlie. <laughs> he will play with the lights when you're on stage. We even say the lights ghost. Or at times, in the dressing rooms, downstairs, in the basement. There where I-5 snakes through downtown at 6th and Cedar, St. Cecilia's Playhouse, the now sadly boarded up defunct theater twice over, converted from a funeral chapel, the adjoining mortuary, the dressing rooms, shelter an older homeless man in a crypt, as the night watchman, and host a ghost we all called Top Hat. <laughs> a shadowy silhouette, fleetingly spotted between actors and daylight, 
creeping slowly past the pale sunlight fingering through the cracks in the door frame. The theater is rife with such tales, but I can tell you I've worked extensively at both venues, multiple shows and companies, and I've been in those venues alone at night many times. And I've never encountered anything. <laughs> Still, I know they're there. And I can tell you, truly, what can happen if you do not leave a ghost light. <laughs> I was in my late 20s, a late arrival to the theater, but while I still had my hair, had quickly worked my way from publicist and literary manager and dramaturg to, uh, <laughs> well, I'd worked my way up to what I really wanted to do was direct. I was mounting my first show, a Dark Knight production, uh, those weekday nights when our rented venue was not being used for the regular main stage production. It was still light when I left the theater offices, tucked into the old carriage works at 4th and G. I'd worked late to put a press release to bed. I'd be to rehearsal early. Autumn was just starting to get crisp at night, but it was still only twilight. That hour or so when daytime downtowners hasten home and the different denizens of nighttime downtown emerge. Made my way down the block to the venue just south of Market, a converted old Victorian in the gas lamp quarter, and let myself into the venue via the heavy wooden double doors. They opened onto one end of the lobby. Staff had nicknamed the coffin because it was painted black, made of scarred wood, oblong, barely bigger than a body, and trapped the ticket-taking staffer there to endure a seemingly endless night during their upteenth experience listening to the muffled performance within. At the other end of the lobby, heavy black curtains draped across a doorway, let directly onto the stage, stage right. From there, I could make out the four risers, uh, rows of not seats, but chairs on platforms rising in shallow half circles in the black. Now, this is the only theater I ever worked in which did not have a ghost light. As first staffer in, this meant I had to switch on the fluorescence the overhead work lights located stage left on the opposite side of the darkened stage. This entailed creeping my way across the painted black wooden floor, letting the black drape drop behind me. Before my eyes could adjust in the dark, I bumped into something. The single set piece, large butcher's block, center stage. From there, I made my way stage left to the light switch on the upstage wall which the set designer had managed to mask, treated to look like some dark corner of Glamp's castle. The main stage show was the Scottish play, fans of theater superstitions will appreciate. And at that <laughs> moment, my thoughts were focused on how I was going to stage my quirky, fringy, romantic comedy set in modern Manhattan on Lady M's goddamn dungeon. <laughs> so my hand found the stage left light switch, though. I was hit by a strong sensation of not being alone in the room. A pulse, the feel of eyes behind me. As I turned slowly, I sensed a figure, a woman, white, I can't say why even now. White dress, glowing white, I, I can't say. I neither saw nor heard, but only sensed a profoundly unhappy person telling me angrily to get out. My instinctive response was to stand a little taller and declare, I have to be here. <laughs> Aloud to an empty room, <laughs> nothing stirring in it, nothing visible. 
I felt like a witless dog growling at the door when there's nothing there, sport. <laughs> <laughs> I chuckled at myself aloud, feeling ridiculous. Then I flicked on the lights, went about my business. Show was great, thanks. <laughs> and thought nothing more of it. Until. A week later, we had an early Saturday AM production meeting. Yes, a horror in itself. <laughs> they are at least lively and breastedly brisk because artists are busy and no one has time, especially not my artistic director and the production stage manager responsible for both our main stage and dark night shows. We all worked alone in the rented venue. This was our chance to compare notes. As Ginny wrapped the meeting at the venue, <laughs> we all rose to leave when Maria, who had to stay on, cocked her eye and asked us, have either of you seen anything in here? The three of us looked at each other and nodded slowly, then silently settled back into our seats. Before anyone could speak further, Jenny suggested we all take a long moment to jot down what we each had experienced so we would not influence each other's perceptions. Jenny was sure it was a woman, though Maria saw only white. Jenny said she was sad, Maria angry audible to Jenny, who closed her eyes when she directed, visible to Maria, who hardly blinked at the light board. There was only one thing that all three of us agreed upon, where the energy we sensed emanated from. Row C, seat three. A week after, a man broke into the theater. It was night, a dark night, late in the run, so no one was there, but I came by in the morning to talk to the cops. They had already apprehended the suspect, a cop told me. A heroin addict, they'd found babbling nonsense and bleeding in the street a block or two away. And this cop was just finishing up the report. He walked me through the building. The man had wrapped his hand in his own ragged T-shirt then bashed it through the glazed wire mesh reinforced security windows in the basement below street level. The cop showed me the small amount of broken glass inside the basement window beside the bloody t-shirt. I could see where the injured man had made his way across the dark basement. Drip. Blip. Drip. Blip. And then upstairs very close together as he crept along the backstage hallway, trying the dressing room doors along the way. Blip, blip, smear, blip, blip, smear. And then rounding the corner, stage left, right, there by the light switch, the intruder would have turned and seen or heard or felt and been overwhelmed by the wave, the immense misery and rage of whatever was occupying that third chair back and three off the aisle. The cop couldn't figure this part. Bloody handprints marred the stone treatment upstage by the light switch, smeared red handprints up and down the white enameled walls along the hallway, back past the dressing rooms, showed that the man clambered and fell the whole way toward the steep stairway, tumbling to the bottom where a small but startling amount of blood beaded on the cold concrete floor. And then, Across the basement, toward the window, a few widely spattered marks. Blip, 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 blip. There was a much larger amount of broken glass outside the window than in. Yeah, the cop exhaled, kicking through it. It was pretty cut up, half naked, screaming his junkie drivel in the gutter. No property recovered on him. The cop wrote it off to the smack. 
But as even my most cynical friend who had reason to know pointed out, heroin addicts don't go breaking and entering when they're high. They're looking for a fix when they do that, right? And so the guy wasn't high. Out of his gore, desperate? Sure, maybe. How many days without food or rest or any sense of security? How many people to turn to had he burned through? And stumbling around lightheaded from the loss of blood, as another colleague who had reason to know suggested, hell, he might have imagined all kinds of horrors. A century ago, we later learned, when our city's stingery district swelled with bar rooms and opium dens and other vices, the smaller gas lamp quarter theater, later trendy Cafe Sevilla, now a pizza joint, <laughs> was fourth between Market and Island, had been that type of 10 cents a dance parlor where, for two bits more, you gain access to the cribs of the brothel upstairs. We found a tabloid article in the San Diego Sun, a verified suicide at the site almost a century ago. It was a young woman, as you guess, found in her bedclothes. They didn't say the color. One of the brothel's many inmates, as they were called. Doubtless so miserable with her lot in life, she felt she just couldn't go on. The gas lamp quarter was filled with stories like that. Is. Is filled with stories like that. The quotidian detail of the wounded heroin addict sliced up screaming his agony in the street should be the most horrific aspect of my tale. But we've all witnessed as bad or worse. Maybe just not in the theater not in the gasoline quarter. <laughs> Ghost stories are to remind us of the real horrors, the ones so horrible we can't face them in the light of day, the ones we're too busy daydreaming more romantic comedies or Shakespeare retreads to stop and acknowledge, the ones we all look away from. The ghost light in the theater cannot be much comfort to the ghosts. But I've always been happy for the ghost light since. And when I come back, if I come back, I will go slow. Be still for a moment before I set to work. I will listen better. Look at things that aren't easy to see. I'll keep a light on. The next time I see a ghost light shining from the stage of an empty, otherwise pitch black theater, I will stand tall and tell those ghosts, I have to be here. Belize City is not a good place for tourists. It's not even a good place for Belize. It used to be the nation's capital until the government got so tired of it flooding all the time that they moved it to Belmopan, an inland city that wasn't steadily sinking into the Caribbean. But I didn't know any of that. I didn't know Belize City is merely a temporary way station Western tourists endure before escaping to some manicured resort with heated spas and lobster dishes where eager bellhops will, without hesitation, climb a tree, harvest a coconut, bore a hole into it, and use it to serve you a tropical cocktail at the cost of 17 US dollars. <laughs> and I certainly didn't know any of that when I booked a last minute hotel in Belize City before my best friend's wedding at one of those resort islands. 
I eagerly awaited and mortally feared attending this wedding at the same time. As my departure date creeped closer, I dealt with the strange anticipation by basically winging it. I did more research choosing what TV to buy than I did preparing for my first visit to the developing world. My hotel sent a car to pick me up at the airport. The early 2000s Honda bolted away from the terminal, the driver eager to return for his next fare. The highway dissipated into the chalky passages of the third world, unpaved pathways with no discernible lanes, just spaces where if a car can fit, a car's gonna go. We bounced along on shot suspension toward the city while I made good use of the grab handle over the doorframe. The wedding wasn't for two more days, so I booked a guided cave tour in the rainforest. Super touristy, I know, but I figured if I left this country without doing something outdoorsy and the new Facebook profile photo to prove it, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> My friend would be ashamed of me too. What kind of groom wants an untraveled neophyte in his exotic Central American wedding? As the Honda burrowed deeper into the city and the urban sprawl thickened, I pictured him lazing around the pool on his island resort, sipping a cocktail with his betrothed. The taxi arrived, and I checked in. The owner's name was Shauna, and she welcomed me inside with her pleasant Creole accent. It felt nice to know a person's name here. I had the entire afternoon to kill, so I asked her where the bus stop was, so I'd know where to go for the cave tour the next morning. Shauna said it was four blocks away, so I decided to walk. It had rained the day before, and milky white puddles filled potholes, some wide enough to earn a sheet of plywood to cover them up. Seabirds fought over scraps of trash in pools of standing water. I needed to keep moving. If I stopped or slowed, I'd disappear into one of those puddles, one more hapless tourist swallowed up. Everything along the road made sense in a developing nation kind of way. Cars barreled by in clouds of white dust, and guys meandered down streets on bikes avoiding the puddles. Scavenging dogs crossed in nimble bounds, long tongues lolling out of their mouths in the punishing delta humidity. The only thing that didn't make sense on the street was me, a 30-year-old white guy walking in flip-flops, <laughs> navigating by Google Maps. One of the bicycle guys wheeled past. He turned his head at me, and his handlebars wobbled on a bumpy road. He studied the bike and made a wide arc, you turning all the way around to eyeball me again. A second bicyclist drove past. I slowly put the phone in my pocket and stopped. The quarter mile I'd walked from the hotel now felt like a dozen. Hey, gringo. It was a young woman carrying a bag of groceries. A bundle of oranges and white netting poked out of the top. You shouldn't be out here, she said. I heard those guys talking. They're going to rob you. They should name a drink after the combination of fear and embarrassment I felt. It's a jigger of wounded pride and a shot of self-judgment, finished with a garnish of survival instinct. I doubted she made a habit of being the unwitting savior of Western visitors who believed they could saunter through her town without incident. She probably just preferred to go home without witnessing anyone beaten and mugged at 2 p.m. on a Wednesday. Or maybe she did it to avoid the government and media descending on her little corner of the world. The way American suburban life is disrupted whenever a little blonde girl goes missing. She was a woman who, with a single glance over her groceries, knew volumes more about me than I would ever know about her. I thanked her and went back to the hotel. Shauna glanced at me over the front desk as if she knew I hadn't even gotten close to the bus station. That's when I googled crime in Belize City. <laughs> I should have done this before booking a hotel here, but there I was, reading a State Department warning on my hotel's very Wi-Fi network. There is a level two travel advisory in effect for Belize City, which noted the south side of the city, my side, was particularly hostile. There were 40 homicides in the last year within three square miles. I scrolled to another paragraph. The police are actively investigating. However, all murders in recent years remain unsolved. All murders. All of them. <laughs> I bought four beers from Shauna, then went out to the balcony overlooking the river. Fishing boats and dinghies motored by under the fading sunlight, sliding through floating garbage and broken wood pallets. I noticed a French couple sitting on the balcony, looking decidedly more comfortable than me. I mustered up the courage to talk to them. Matthew spoke English and introduced his girlfriend, Marie, who spoke little. 
They were firefighters from Paris, and they invited me to join them at a nearby restaurant. I couldn't have asked for better travelers to befriend. At dinner, Matthew asked me a lot of questions about the president and translated my answers for Marie. I told Matthew about my encounter on the road, an anecdote he also translated to his girlfriend. When your story about nearly getting stabbed gets told in two languages, you know you've really fucked up. <laughs> Rattled from the experience, I told him I was thinking about canceling the cave tour the next morning and just getting on the next boat to the islands where my friends waited for me. They urged me not to. And after several more beers with my French custodians, I promised them I wouldn't. On the way back from dinner, I watched in amazement as Matthew negotiated a ride with a taxi driver, haggling him down to a reasonable price. It was expert work. I can't even haggle at farmer's markets. <laughs> a few hours of restless sleep later, I sat in the lobby, waiting for my own taxi to drive me the distance I foolishly attempted to walk the day before. It was 4.30 a.m., and the street lamps bloomed deep orange in the fog. The driver was late, because what's the rush to drive a guy four blocks? But he eventually arrived, and I, about four minutes later, I was at the bus station. I gave him a tip, bigger than the fare itself, and thanked him then hoisted my backpack and stepped into the bus stop. It was 5 a.m., and I felt flooded with adrenaline, but not that cool, vigilant kind they teach in special forces, more like the nervous energy of a Boston Terrier. <laughs> I waited on a bench as the bus blinked its hazard lights. A young girl sidled up to me and asked for a dollar. Then she asked again. I ignored her. Instead, I fixated on a soldier of the Bleasin military who waited for the same bus. His uniform was crisp, and his, cocky, his khaki combat boots were laced tight. That was a man who knew where he was going. On the bus, Google Maps still worked. The blue dot advanced along the highway as the gum trees and Caribbean pines sped by. Hills of wild jungle rolled past under a gray morning. If the blue dot could get where it needed to be, so could I. After a brief rest stop outside of Belmo Pond, my moment approached. I asked to get off along a stretch of road with no discernible stops, which annoyed the driver. He braked to a slow roll and craked open the door, and I stepped out just as the bus accelerated again, determined to make its scheduled route despite the American, it just dumped onto the side of a jungle highway. <laughs> the bus drove away, and I stood there, alone. I scrambled for my phone and took a picture before the bus rumbled out of view. Then it was quiet. I had a sudden urge to get off the road and hide in the bushes. Any moment now, someone would come down the road, I thought. Perhaps it would be the same guys on bikes coming to finish me off, only this time there'd be no helpful woman with a bag of groceries to save me. <laughs> I hiked the remaining two miles to the tour company, muttering little words of encouragement to myself as sweat formed a damp triangle under my pack. As I munched on a cliff bar and some dried fruit, I started to believe I was successfully failing my way through this country. An hour later, my tour guide wrestled an old British army truck through the jungle. The six-wheeled behemoth was a holdover from the country's colonial days. We arrived at the trailhead. Two tour guides, an American couple, and me. And we readied our gear. It felt familiar. The straps of my pack under my shoulders made sense. My boots were old friends. I've always loved that feeling right before a hike. The ground was soft and exciting, and this was terrain that I'd never trekked before. The trail was thick with overgrowth, dense grass and sticky mud. The guide pointed out a leopard print. We stopped and listened to the croak of a poison dart frog. He identified a devilish-looking poison tree, its bark like razor wire, then pointed out another spiky plant that was evidently the antidote to the tree. <laughs> On national park trails back home, I would joyfully run my hands over stones and tree trunks and leaves, absorbing the textures through my skin. But on this trail, everything wanted to kill me. <laughs> Four miles into the jungle, we clicked on our headlamps and entered the cave. It was cool and inviting, and a torrent of water ran the length of the chamber. Blind insects like wispy demons skittered about. We squeezed through a passage barely two feet in height, allowing the current to carry our bodies through. At the largest chamber, our guide spoke of the Mayans who interred their dead there. We switched off our headlamps. It was a darkness unlike anything I had experienced, a pure distillation of the senses, where all that remained was sound and smell, the quiet whisper of wind from the chamber's exit a half mile east, the trickle of water over stone, damp and odorous, the silence of the ancient dead. Everything was still 
and calm and special and new. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to explore that cave for hours, or as long as my headlamp's battery would permit me. But a few hours later, I sat in another taxi, rumbling through the squalor of Belize City. The sun was going down when the driver pulled up to the hotel. Shauna stood outside, smoking his cigarette in the fading light. Her security guard sat in a chair next to her, eyeballing everyone who passed. My stomach ached for dinner, but I had no interest in leaving the hotel in search of a restaurant. My French guardians were gone, so I ordered more beer, took refuge once again on the balcony, and drank. The next morning, I finally boarded a boat for my friend's resort. I could see tiny islands in the distance overgrown with mangroves. The boater weaved through the harbor into open water, gunned the throttle, and pulled away from the sinking city. Thank you. My mother was hell-bent on dragging us to synagogue. My brothers and I wanted to watch cartoons. The stakes were set, our battle lines were drawn, and the Saturday morning wars began for another week. I'm still impressed with her devotion at dragging us to services week after week. This was back in the 80s when cartoons were only on TV Saturday mornings, and every second that we could drag out this getting ready dance was a stolen treasure trove of animation. My brother and I drifted back to the television as we took turns finding excuses to stall. Missing shoes, bathroom breaks, crying, hunger pains, spilled cereal, milking out as many minutes as we could. It was so unfair that we'd be stripped away from this joy to put on itchy suits and dragged to the most boring place on earth. We were always the last family to arrive. Embarrassed, my mother gave us a don't make a noise glare so we could slip in the back unnoticed, then greet everyone afterwards as if we'd been there the whole time. Our penny loafers clicked with each step as we got closer to the cantor's low baritone drowning on in Hebrew. Baruch atah, atah. The seconds still sloshed by in those hard sanctuary seats. They were the longest of my life. I'd memorized every stained glass window, studied every image on the altar, and counted every pattern on the ceiling. My brother and I would sneak out to the bathroom protesting that we had to go so bad and we couldn't hold it. And 20 minutes later, my mother would come out screaming through her clenched teeth as we played paper football with ripped up flyers advertising the sisterhood brunch in. As I got older, I did my best to step away from all this joyless dogma that my religion encompassed. I was dragged to holiday services and celebrated with family, but I also read up on Eastern philosophy and poke holes in our strict observances as my circle widened to encompass Christians, Mormons, Buddhists, and Hindus. The religion that had defined so much of who my family was didn't seem to have room for those who were different. I eventually ended up settling on the other side of the country, where I was free to avoid any sort of religious observances. The only time that I was proper Jew-guilted to go home was for the occasional Passover Seder meal. It was something I could not escape, and I dreaded it. My grandfather had always thrown this epic, never-ending Seder. His whole career, he had been a cantor who led the services of the synagogue, and that meant that no page or passage was skipped out of the Haggadah. The meal was served painstakingly slow, and every course was accompanied by an explanation, ritual, and more prayers. We were starving. The festival meal dragged out for hours, until midnight frequently. Family members with babies would beg him to finish, so we could just have to sing every song, though, as he pointed to half-asleep family members to recite their portion. Then about seven years ago, he passed away, and he was gone, and so were his satyrs. Over time, I'd often lost brothers and uncles who were prime personalities in those meals. When I began to digitize our home movies, I rewatched these satyrs again with new eyes and it filled me with joy. 
Everyone was suffering in unison. We laughed in frustration as my uncles bullied their way through expedited songs. The four questions always asked by the youngest member of my family would be directed at embarrassed teenagers. These slivers of satyrs were time capsules of my childhood. It wasn't about belief in anything greater than belief in my own family's identity. My mother had picked up the mantle of the Seder leader, adding her own pages to the service and channeling my grandfather. This was the most salient link to my past, and I began looking forward to making new memories every year. It made me feel closer to the people I had left and the ones I had lost. Last year, she explained that she couldn't handle the cooking and clean up with her health problems. My younger brother and I promised that we would make it easy. She was given strict orders to only cook a few items instead of the ambitious recipes she always tried to do all at once every year. We would buy the rest. We followed Hurricane Sarah around the kitchen, as I called her, since she never put anything away, leaving a trail of spills, spices, pots, pans, and bowls, a tsunami of kitchen carnage. We washed every pot as she worked, cleaned every surface, and plated things, setting tables, and organizing Seder plates. And when she was ready to tackle the next task on her list, they were all done. She did her Seder, and it was a worthy successor to my Zeta Maris, her father. She shared photos on Facebook of her two sons who made this happen. I flew back to California and got a frantic 3 a.m. call that she had to go through the dumpster and pull out the cracked disposable plates that we had thrown out because they were very expensive special plates for Passover. And even though the silver coating was peeling off, they were fine to use for years to come. But that's my mother. This year, COVID-19 made gathering for a Seder out of the question. In all this fog of abnormality, this was the most poignant. This was the one time a year we got together. I'd been calling my parents every day, sending masks and mailing out hand sanitizers and making sure that she wasn't getting all her medical guidance from Fox News. She was stuck in Florida where they wintered. As two high-risk people at a time when both Florida and Texas were blowing up, traveling back to Dallas wasn't an option. I got off the phone with her a week before we would have had our first Seder, and I heard the profound sadness in her voice. I wanted to fix this. She needed this. I needed this. We all needed this. I called my sister-in-law and asked her if she could be free for a Zoom Seder. She protested, but I have to clean. I don't have all this stuff. I explained to her that literally nobody would see the house or the table Hell, you could fake it with all the Seder plate items. This was really for my mother. I left my younger brother voicemails, text messages, and emails over several days. This was the bare minimum to get him to respond. I locked him down for the time and told him to please be punctual, knowing that he would probably show up in the first hour or so, maybe, if we were lucky. In the days following up, I argued with my mother to please use a standard digital Haggadah book for the Seder that we could all access from Dallas, Florida, and California where we were scattered. She insisted that we had to use the one that she had in her house because it was the best one. So it sent me on a next door spiral of Haggadah hunting. Finally, the night before, an elderly lady five miles away offered to leave it outside her door in exchange for a homemade hand sanitizer. I locked my mother down for two hours of meticulous run-throughs of the video conferencing app painstakingly running her through every step and repeating it. I sent her a video tutorial I made with written instructions and I sat there with her saying there was really just four clicks but somehow it became a frustrated tear-filled melee of click the three dots. Don't click the X. Not the X. Why did you click the X? The three dots. It's three dots in the right hand corner. It looks like three dots. Put your glasses on. Why did you click the X again? The Seder came and it went perfect without any issues, is what I'd like to say, but that's a lie. There's this two-minute video of me seeming like I'm being excessively cruel to my mother over technology. But again, we walked through this app and worked hard over two hours to avoid this. 45 minutes in, my mother asked where my younger brother was. I explained that I called, texted, and emailed several times throughout the day and we are going on without him. 
He suddenly popped up on screen, shirtless, holding his dog. No wine, Seder plate, Haggadah, or anything. But we pushed on. My nephews drifted on and off the screen. Most of the time, you could only see the top of my mother's head. We had to spend 10 minutes asking her to pull the screen back momentarily so we could acknowledge the existence of my father. We talked as we ate. My mother delegated songs to various family members. We laughed. Pets took over the screens. The Seder went too long. Audio cut out. And it felt oddly normal. And even though we were staring at each other through computer screens and tablets, it felt like we were just a family, sitting together for a meal and carrying on a tradition that we'd suffered through for generations. Everybody, welcome to your stage to the next performer, Lake Cooper! Mm -hmm. I was baptized Lutheran, confirmed congregational, or Christian light, as my evangelical friend called it, <laughs> and spent years as a Christian scientist before giving up religion once and for all in my early 20s. It was then that the religion door shut hard and spirit climbed in a window with a beehive seven inch heels and I'll take it from here look. I am both rational and spiritual. I believe in gravity, but I also believe in karma. I believe the veil between this world and the next is very thin. I second Hamlet when he declared, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. One thing I've learned over the years is, when spirit wants your attention, it'll first tap you on the forehead. No reply, it'll slap you in the face. <laughs> and if you still don't get it, it'll hit you upside the head with a right hook. I got hit with a right hook. Enter Carl. My friend Carl was larger than life, a magical, living, breathing elf. He lived in this world, but was not of it, and new experiences were his drug. A metaphysical massage therapist, actor, energy coach, and artistic director of a theater company, he was always ready to laugh. He was the guy at a graveside who, at just the right moment, would make a joke and have the entire funeral party giggling in relief. <laughs> Carl and I were fellow travelers, side by side on the road to Spiritville. He was my teacher and on occasion I was his. We weren't lovers, we both had great partners, but loved being in each other's company. He seemed to know what I needed long before I did and he was always, and I mean always, up for an adventure. Could he be annoying? You betcha. <laughs> Carl saw your potential, where you were supposed to be, supposed to go, what you were supposed to learn, and supposed to teach. Then he would do everything in his power to get you there, no matter what it took, no matter how hard you fought. It was my first year as co-producer of an enormous designer fashion show fundraiser. Women's donated designer wear was sold to benefit charity. It was produced by women for women. It was the evening of our first donor event at a grand old country club. I was busy schmoozing donors when all of a sudden conversation hushed and in walked a fella trompsing down the gone with the wind size staircase straight through the crowd as though he owned the place was Carl. I had not invited him but he knew in his magical way that I could really use the friendly support. After introductions and a glass of wine, Carl told me he'd be happy to donate a piece of men's clothing, at the same time unbuttoning his well-worn acrylic cardigan sweater. It was covered in a rich array of pills, pulls, and snags. This clearly is a designer piece, he said with a sly wink. And yes, I would be happy to donate it. I know you want it. Playing along, I finally informed him that sadly the event was for women's wear only. What? I'm hurt. I'm really hurt, he said <laughs> with mock indignation. So when you decide to sell menswear and you come begging for the sweater, you are not going to get it. 
He and I laughed and joked about the sweater that night and far beyond. Not long after, Carl informed me that he had registered the next fall to attend two week-long courses at a place just outside of London called Arthur Findlay College. He'd read about it in the back of an old book he'd found describing it to me as a kind of spiritual spa, likening it to Esalen or the Deepak Chopra Center. <laughs> it was the world headquarters of spiritualism, he said, and insisted that I join him, declaring that it would be an adventure we needed to have. I'd been searching for the next step on my metaphysical journey, and if Carl was in, so was I. Seeing photos of the Downton Abbey-like manor home and grounds sealed the deal for me. When we arrived the next fall and drove up the college's long driveway in our taxi from the airport, we were in awe of the grounds. Magnificent gardens, horse pastures, sheep fields. This your first time at Spooks Hall then? Our cabbie asked as we approached the entrance. Spooks Hall? What was that all about? After registration, I went up to my room to settle in and looked over our course offerings. Deep trance mediumship, sketching spirit faces in profile, communicating with your dead pets. <laughs> hmm, where were the hot stone massages? <laughs> the astrology and tarot readings, the yoga. What the hell had I gotten myself into? Talking to the dead was not anything I had ever really thought about, studied, or wanted to do. The idea creeped me out. Besides, there was a small but still powerful voice in my head from Sunday school days, reminding me that such endeavors were the equivalent of making marmalade with baby parts <laughs> and the devil himself stirring the pot. I spent the better part of the lectures that first week with my arms folded defensively over my chest, gazing out at the horses in the pasture. We studied from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. with students from all over the world, all of them complete strangers to us. If spiritualism is the art, you'd say mediums are the artists. The objective is to bring dead people through with healing messages for the living, proving life goes on. Being successful at mediumship requires presenting the sitter, the person the medium reads for, with credible evidence. Evidence refers to specific characteristics, habits, oddities of appearance, personality traits belonging to the deceased that the sitter would recognize. With each session, I became more and more fascinated, and my arms unfolded. Week two was much more challenging. We were expected to jump right into the power, or the power, as we Yanks would say, and were expected to have at least one spirit visit for each and every sitting. One morning, midway through the week, it was announced that a renowned medium from Scotland, Duncan H., would be conducting a demonstration for the entire college in the Grand Hall. Duncan was a big, smelly deal in the world of mediumship, and the staff was a buzz. He would bring up to the stage random pairs to have a go at pulling in spirit for one another. If the evidence given sounded like someone the sitter knew, they were to say, I can take that. That was a thumbs up telling the medium to carry on. During the special session, people did their best to bring in spirits for the better part of two hours. But overall, the session was a bit of a fizzle. At last, there was time for one final pair of students. Unexpectedly, unexpectedly, with more than a little trepidation, I was chosen. My partner, Ashley, was an experienced professional medium from a nearby village. I was about to be humiliated. <laughs> Ashley wasted no time looking me straight in the eyes. I have an older man here with me. He's tall, he has gray hair, kind of chubby. Evidence that could fit no less than 187 million people. <laughs> Nothing more. 
I could take none of the evidence she offered. And I came up blank for Ashley. We sat there fidgeting for a few few minutes longer, but no one from Spirit even waved hello. Feeling embarrassed and like an absolute failure, I declared to the room, uh, sorry, but this mediumship thing, not for me. That's perfectly all right, Duncan said. Let us end our session here. Good try, everyone. Thank you all and have a lovely evening. People gathered their belongings and started walking out of the hall. As I leaned over to grab my sweater that had fallen off the chair, I was startled by the loud voice of a young woman beckoning me. Listen, please listen, please stay and listen. I really need you to tell my story. Her voice and my mind was at once assertive and anxious. This wasn't someone that was about to let me go. Duncan saw me hesitate with a startled look on my face and asked if I was all right. I think I have a young woman here with me and it seems she really needs to talk. He quickly turned to the exit and called everyone back into the hall. There I was, alone with him on stage. All eyes were on me, but I hardly noticed. When he said, what are you getting? The words just gushed out of me. Um, I have a young woman here, uh, 19, maybe 19 or 20. She's average height, not very tall. She's very bubbly and strong. She has a short pixie-like haircut, sandy hair with highlights that she's telling me she did herself. She's wearing what looks like Oshkosh by gosh faded denim overalls with one shoulder strap unfastened and hanging. She's holding out her arm, which is covered in tattoos. They're not colored tats, but in grays and blacks, what looks like a paisley pattern over her entire left arm. She's telling me that while she is not a cutter, she's very close to someone who is. I had to force myself to draw breath, as the need to be her voice overwhelmed me. At this point, Duncan drew closer. With tears welling up in his eyes, the room grew quiet. He steadied himself and in a shaken voice said, I can take that, all of that. That is my daughter. I shuddered at the enormity of the experience and its emotional repercussions, but I knew I couldn't stop. She's telling me, I really didn't want to die, Dad. I really didn't. His voice lowered, and he began to choke up. My daughter, he said to the room with a quivering voice, was severely epileptic since childhood. On break from college, she told me her anti-seizure meds were causing her to gain weight. She wanted to stop taking her medication, and I pleaded with her not to. I assured her that together, we would find another drug. A few weeks later, at school, alone, during a grand mall seizure, my daughter died. She had stopped taking her drugs. Through his tears, he said quietly, you were right. My daughter was very close to a cutter. The cutter is her sister his eyes wide as saucers, grabbing in his pockets for a handkerchief. Duncan walked past me and off the stage to get outside for air, dismissing the class along the way. When he left the room, his daughter's spirit stopped talking. Those remaining clamored around me, marveling at what the newbie had done. In a minute or two, he returned to the room. As I moved to leave the stage, and as he was gathering his notes from the lectern, his daughter spoke to me again, softer this time. Your daughter is saying, I love you very much, Dad, and I'm always with you. The times when you felt my presence in your demonstrations and workshops, I've been at your side helping you. He looked at me with the depth of gratitude I'd yet to experience. His shoulders dropped. It turned out that this was the message he had been seeking 
for quite some time. I understood in that moment why I was at Arthur Findlay College. I got it, loud, clear, unmistakably. I knew why Carl had insisted that I be there. It was to be with that man, that father of that young woman. During the next year, my friendship with Carl grew deeper. But little did I know that would be the last year we'd have together. On January 3rd, 2014, Carl died suddenly. His loss was excruciating. In subsequent visits to Arthur Finley, I always expected him to come through, but he never did. I kept hoping, all the while knowing that one can't simply dial up the dead. A few years later, my husband took me up the coast to Carmel on my birthday. As is my custom, I booked a tarot reading for the day of. It took place in the back room of a stock room of a small bookstore. I was really excited to be with a reader who was new to me. She introduced herself, spritzed the room with sage mist, and offered me a seat at a small table covered with crystals and angel figurines. She no sooner began shuffling the cards when she stopped suddenly and looked up at me with a furrowed brow. Whoa, I don't normally do this in these sessions, but there is a spirit here, a very strong one. It's a man who tells me he knows you and he has a message for you. Oh, okay. I said, figuring it was probably one of my grandpas or maybe my uncle who had died a few months before. I don't understand it. What he's saying, she continued, makes no sense to me. No sense to me at all. None. He keeps smiling and pointing at himself and telling me, uh-uh, sorry, I know you really want it, but you still cannot have the sweater. <laughs> Crisscross my heart. <laughs> Thank you. There was an eye looking at me, an eye where there shouldn't have been an eye, and it lingered too long. I was a pretty damn happy kid, went to Catholic school and liked it. I was an altar boy and liked it. On Monday nights, I sat on the couch eating popcorn and watching Little House on the Prairie with my mom. Thursday was the Waltons. The first album I ever bought with my own money was Kenny Rogers' The Gambler. The first song I ever knew all the words to was Kenny Rogers' The Gambler. I was perfectly happy in my little suburban bubble. I was a small boy but I was lucky enough to find something that I was really good at. I was a swimmer. And from the age of 8 to 12, I felt a little bit like a god, or if not a god, at least a hero. Parents of my competitors would say, how does he do it? He's so little. <laughs> my dad always told me, Kev, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. So I stood on the starting blocks with the other boys, children who were the same age as me, but a head taller, sometimes more. And I beat them. Yeah. And there's that eye invading my privacy. Like if you saw a face outside your bedroom window at night. But it's not a face, it's just an eye, not even a whole eye, just a sliver of an eye peeking through a crack thinner than a child's little finger. And then the eye, it was gone. 
I won a lot of medals, over 50 by the time I was 12, gold, silver, bronze, others. Sometimes they gave medals for the top six, sometimes for the top eight, sometimes trophies for the top three and medals for fourth through eighth. I won a lot of trophies too. During the fall and winter, my mom and I crisscrossed the middle Atlantic states like we were on some kind of quest. When I was fast enough, I won treasure. <laughs> Medals, trophies, rosettes, which are big fancy ribbons like at the county fair. <laughs> Those are my favorite. And each medal, trophy, and rosette was redeemable for what I really craved. Praise, approval, admiration. The eye is back again. It leaves and comes back and leaves again. And I don't know what to say because I really don't know how to speak for myself. It's a problem with me, especially with adults. I'm only 12 years old and I'm already afraid of being exposed as a fraud. So most of the time, I just say nothing. I keep my mouth shut. I really didn't even like competing. I've always been too competitive to like competing. It, it mattered too much. It matters too much, winning and losing. So most of the time at swim meets, a softball-sized lump of nerves and anxiety and fear of failure rested in the pit of my stomach and it grew like a cartoon snowball rolling downhill until diarrhea. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in YMCA bathrooms during swim meets as a kid. The YMCA bathroom kind of sucks, especially for a little kid. You have to walk through the showers and navigate a forest of steam and pale old bodies in varying states of decay. <laughs> drooping shoulders, drooping faces, drooping bellies, and drooping genitals. <laughs> Emerging from the showers by the lockers, a melange of B.O., mildew, and feet permeates the air. But that's just a prelude to the smell of shit urine, chlorine bleach, and ammonia that assaults your nostrils once you get to the bathroom. The tile floor is cold and clammy on your bare feet. The area around the base of the toilets and the urinals is more than slippery. It's a little slimy. There are usually two or three stalls, and one of the toilets is always plugged up, probably filled to the brim by some other nervous kid. And that's where I was when I saw the eye peeking through a crack of a bathroom stall during a YMCA swim meet. I was 12 years old. The eye had come and gone and come and gone again. I was in there for like probably 20 minutes. And when I opened the door, he was standing there with his long, greasy hair, his pimply face, and his Coke bottle glasses. I think he wore a t-shirt with horizontal stripes. I know I wore a blue Speedo with vertical gold stripes. He stepped towards me, and I thought he was just making a gesture with his hand as he said, that looks like a pretty big lump you've got there. But he wasn't just making a gesture. He was reaching out to touch me. And he did. Come on, man. Was all I could get out. Afterwards, I was ashamed, embarrassed, confused, and angry, mostly at myself. I felt so small, 
Why hadn't I done anything? Why didn't I punch him in his face when he touched me? When I saw him in the hallway later that day, why hadn't I pointed and shouted, Hey, everybody, this guy's a pervert. Worst of all was when my mom asked me if something was the matter. I used to tell my mom everything. When I was 10 years old, I had my first crush on a girl my age. She was a swimmer too. She had rosy cheeks and super long hair. And when she curled her hair up under her swimming cap, the other boys called her conehead. I probably did too. <laughs> but I sure liked her. And I couldn't tell anybody. It was too embarrassing, liking a girl. <laughs> but then one night, I came out of swim practice and met my mom in the lobby where she always waited, reading a book or writing a letter to her mom. I knelt next to her chair and laid my head on her shoulder. I just had to tell somebody. How was practice, she asked. I put my lips close to her ear and I whispered, I like Karen Shellen. <laughs> my face warmed and I don't remember what she said, but I remember she took me seriously and I felt like she understood. I used to tell my mom everything but not this. I didn't win any medals that swim meet. On the way home, I sat in silence next to my mom listening to Billy Joel on the Walkman that I'd gotten for Christmas a few days earlier. The last track on the album is titled Captain Jack. As a kid, I always felt a little bit dirty for liking that song because he thinks see he sings about pot and masturbation and suicide you know nowadays the neighbor kid a couple of doors down has been playing grand theft auto since he was like eight years old killing cops and prostitutes <laughs> But here I was, 12 years old, listening to Billy Joel, of all things, and I didn't get half of what he was talking about. But I played that song, Captain Jack, over and over on the two-hour ride home. You go to the village in your tie-dye jeans. You stare at the junkies and the closet queens. It's like some pornographic magazine and you smile. But Captain Jack will get you high tonight. Just a little push and you'll be smiling. I didn't know exactly who or what Captain Jack was, but it sounded pretty good to me. That someone could live in a world that was clearly shit and still smile about it. It sounded like someone who understood. I wish it could have been my mom. But on that night, it was just me, Billy Joel, and Captain Jack. Walking into Saula's small adobe house felt like arriving home. It was held up by wooden stilts in the small town of Tlahuil Tortepec, Oaxaca. Two calendars hung on her slightly crumbling wall. One was of the solar calendar that the town square and the rest of Mexico lived by. The other was the lunar calendar, written in a language that I had never heard of until a few months prior, Mije. The Mija tribe of Oaxaca prides itself most on one simple fact. They were never conquered. Not by the Aztecs, not by the Mayans. 
and not even by the Spanish. The Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés, in his letter to the King of Spain, wrote, In the whole territory of Mexico, from one sea to the other, the natives serve without complaint, save for two provinces which lie between. In these two provinces, the people are called the Mijes. Their land is so rocky that it cannot be crossed even on foot for I have twice sent people to conquer them who are unable to do so because of the roughness of the terrain and because the warriors are very fierce and well-armed. As we sat on wooden stools on her dirt floor and sipped weak cinnamon café de la olla out of wooden bowls, which my espresso addicted American body still had trouble accepting as coffee, I felt incredibly lucky to have my home in this village where the air was clean, time passed slowly, and all of the anxieties of modern life were left in Oaxaca City. I asked Saula what I had been wondering for a long time. How is it that your tribe was never conquered? Simple, she said. We have kept practicing our rituals. There's a Catholic church in the town center where we worship the Catholic God in Spanish, but there is the mountain El Cerro, El Cerro de Sempotel. Up there, we ask for the blessing of Rey Condoy and Mother Earth. Rey Condoy is the Mije indigenous god that is said to have created the region. He is said to have hatched from an egg along with his serpent sister Tahao, who lives in the rivers and land while he lives in the sky. The big gnarled cypress tree in the center of the town is said to be re the remains of his staff that he threw down to earth after the creation was over. The tallest point of the town, Monte Sempotel, is the closest people can get to him. Saula pointed to it through the mist. I had had a tumultuous time adjusting to my new life in Oaxaca City, where I was living on a Fulbright teaching grant. I had bounced around several unsafe living situations and had once gotten robbed at knife point. But in this mist covered town where indigenous laws governed, I felt completely safe, even if I was an outsider. I met Saula one morning in the Oaxaca City Market. She was selling woven shirts and dresses with the distinct mihe pattern, bright red thread woven into the shapes of the mountains and flowers of the Sierra Norte that burst out of the white fabric. What are you doing in Oaxaca, amiga? You look lost, she had said to me, and we instantly became friends. She invited me to her pueblo to stay with her family. The three hour rickety drive to Tlahuiltoltepec was worth it every time even if most of the people in the town stared at me with suspicion and called me the tall gringa, and some kids pointed and laughed and imitated my accent. I didn't blame them, of course. Outsiders have not always been friendly to them. One French fashion designer had even plagiarized their design and profited from it, not sharing her profits with the Mija artisans who could have really used it. As Saula finished telling me the story of El Rey Condoy, we stared out of the window and she once again pointed El Cerro Sempotel, the tallest point in the Sierra Mije region where the presence of El Rey Condoy can be most felt. It is up there that we practice our rituals, she said. Every time there is a change in season or government, we ask for his blessing in a ceremony led by an adivinador or if someone is having health problems or family issues, the adivinador will lead a different ritual, but they must be done on the very top of the cerro. We are having one ceremony in May. Would you like to come? Si, sí, I had said before she could retract the invitation. I will be there. It's a long walk up to the cerro, said her husband Pepe, and some foreigners don't make it. The mist stops them. To get to the top requires that you have faith in El Rey Condoy. The day of the ceremony, we rose at 4 a.m. and met up with 10 other townspeople loading the camioneta with supplies that we would need for the ceremony. Crates of chickens, buckets of tepache, bottles of mezcal, and corn tortillas. 
we gripped onto the ledges of the back as we drove up a very steep mountain summit. And we finally arrived to the point where the car could no longer drive. The bright sun could still be felt even through the mist and we would be walking the rest of the way up the mountain. I was asked to carry a large bucket of tepache, a fermented ceremonial drink made from agave pulque, which felt so heavy that I thought my arm would fall off. I walked alongside a wide-eyed 11-year-old boy named Miguel, who had watched the movie Space Jam again and again on his family's old VCR and had a lot of questions about American basketball players. Everyone else walked in the silence that I had grown accustomed to. The leader of the ceremony walked ahead of us briskly. In Spanish, he was called adivinador. In Mije, he was called shamabi. When I shared with Saula that this word sounded very similar to shaman, she stared at me confused, saying that she'd never heard of a shaman. Extensive linguistic research has not confirmed my suspected connection to the word shaman, which came from Siberia, but since the Mihe creation story says that their people settled after crossing the Bering Strait from Eurasia, it's quite possible. The shamabi walked briskly ahead of us, carrying a crate with five chickens and two buckets of tepache in each hand. After about a half hour of walking, I began to feel the altitude difference and my breath became heavier. Sweaty, I dragged behind the rest of the group. There was a 70 year old grandma walking in front of me who was carrying a large bucket of tepache like mine in one hand, as well as a crate with two chickens on her back. During our first rest stop, she punched my arm and laughed, saying something in Mija that I could not understand. Miguel, her grandson, translated her words to Spanish for me. She says we'll arrive soon. Don't look so scared, Miguel said. I told Saula that I was feeling sick from the altitude, and I really wasn't sure if I could keep going. Just have faith, she said, mucha fe, that you can get to the top. That is how we have survived. We sat in a clear, grassy opening, and at the end, there was a beautiful stone altar full of bright flowers. This altar is to Mother Earth. Connect with her. The angry, male, vindictive god of my religious fundamentalist upbringing would have considered this to be the work of the devil. But that upbringing had left me hungry for the sacred feminine traditions of Oaxaca. And I did my best to follow Saula's instructions, even though my body was trembling from the climb. Have a shot of mezcal, the grandma told me in Spanish. It'll loosen up your muscles. <laughs> the taste was bitter and smoky, but it did help. I started to sink into the earth, listening to the trickling rivers, which were said to be the blood of the Mije servant goddess, Tahao. I could not understand what the shamabi chanted as he poured tepache over the altar and gave us each a wooden cup to do the same. Each person chanted a few words in Mije before they poured. I poured my tepache silently and asked Mother Nature only for the strength to reach the top. We were getting closer and closer to the sun, which could still be felt through the dense fog. Ya casi, the grandma told me laughing. Todavía no, 10 more minutes. I was amazed by the strength of these women as I trailed steadily behind. There couldn't be much for it further to go. The road was getting narrower and narrower. We walked on the narrow ledge for another hour. I learned that she had told me 10 minutes so that I would relax. <laughs> we walked in a single file line up to the plateau at the very top that rested among the clouds. It looked like a small stage. This was definitely the top. There was nowhere else to go. As we climbed up onto it one by one, I felt my fear of heights taking over. I took a seat next to Saula in the very middle of the plateau, furthest away from the edge where Miguel sat, his feet dangling joyfully as he pointed out the buildings in the town. When the shamabi stepped up to the enormous altar on the far end of the stage, he looked as if he had emerged from the clouds. He decorated the altar with corn husk dolls representing different families in the town, fruit, flowers, and tamale offerings. 
he poured everyone's tepache once again and began the ceremony. For about a half hour, he chanted a prayer to El Rey Condoy. He then took out the first chicken to the altar, raised an ax, and cut off its head. The Mijas are proud that they never had human sacrifices like the Aztecs, only animal sacrifices. He poured tepache over the altar and kept chanting. The body of the headless chicken continued to squirm as it fell onto the floor and the smell of its insides filled the air. The prayer, Saula whispered to me, was for the rain, for the crops, and for the safety of everyone in the town. After another hour of chanting to the Rey Condoy, the Shamabi sacrificed four more chickens and concluded the ceremony by having the grandma smudge us all with herbs to cleanse our energies. After a long silence, he declared in Spanish that the ceremony was over and it was time to eat. We left the ceremonial stage and sat down on some rocks to a meal of corn tortillas and boiled eggs. Never had such a simple meal tasted so good. The ceremony had gone well, Sala told me, and felicidades, you made it. Now we could go back to the town and enjoy the weekend festivities. On our way back down, it began to rain, just as the Shamabi had asked. I stared up at the sky in disbelief as it thundered and poured down stronger. I am still in touch with Saula and she reports that COVID has not reached her town and she believes it is due to these ceremonies. Miguel and I slid down the mountain singing American songs. At the town fiesta that night, a banda played live music on the basketball court in the town center. They celebrated the rain by dancing in it and cooked the chicken carcasses into a delicious stew. I saw the grandma laughing and dancing with several young men in the Pueblo, and she called me forward. Vaila, she commanded, and pulled me out onto the dance floor and into the rain. When the world shut down in March, I was a scientist. To be fair, I'm still kind of a scientist, that part hasn't changed, but back then that was the entirety of how I saw myself. Sure, I just started a career as a journalist. I'd moved from San Diego to Santa Cruz for journalism grad school, and I was working at a radio station in the Bay Area part-time. But when people asked me what I did for work, it felt awkward and wrong to call myself a reporter when chemist was how I'd always used to answer that question. But the pandemic has been a time of change and turmoil for lots of people. I struggled to make sense of the beauty of spring migration, which brought feathered friends to my bird feeders in the Santa Cruz Mountains, while the LA Times COVID tracker meticulously counted the growing number of the infected and dead. I was full of broken, jagged grief and soft, doughy joy. The incongruity was unbearable, and my body felt ill-equipped to process the whirlwind of feelings that came up every time I thought about the future. My normal coping mechanisms, like digging into a research project to find answers in the molecules, weren't going to help me in my new career as a writer or professional pandemic survivor. So I went off the beaten path looking for a way to feel better. And this, my friends, is how I became a fortune teller. Well, sort of. That's maybe a bit dramatic, but let me tell you, the little old Christian ladies in my hometown in Arkansas need only take one look at my androgynous tattooed ass before praying that Jesus free my soul of the devil. One, on my last visit home to Little Rock, an older white lady told me unprovoked that I needed a big old scoop of Jesus. But I don't do Jesus. I do science. And that felt like a dying art, the way the pandemic was going. I only knew a handful of people in Santa Cruz, mostly early career journalists like me. When COVID hit, a few of us started meeting for walks a couple times a week. We'd put on our masks and walk along the beach in the summer heat, working hard to breathe. We talked about how uncertain we felt about our futures, trying to start new careers in journalism as the world seemed to collapse around us. I'd only been in a cur my current fellowship for a couple of months and was already having to apply for new internship opportunities since no one's hiring full-time science writers for the time being. Walking through downtown Santa Cruz, which was unseasonably empty because of the shutdown, 
Everything just felt wrong. Even the statues we passed were masks and gloves. I didn't want to waste my limited social time wallowing, though it didn't feel like wallowing. It felt like I had all of these feelings that were trying to push their way out with no reprieve. Drenched in sweat, I felt my pores clog with unseemly zits that were only half hidden under my mask. The turmoil was going to find its way out of me, one way or another. After one of these walks, I got online and started shopping for tarot cards. Yeah, the fortune-telling cards that you might see in a shrouded booth next to a crystal ball at the carnival. Twenty bucks and a white woman in a turban will, let you, will tell you when and where you'll meet your one true love. It's ridiculous. I know. But I wasn't looking to start casting spells. A friend of mine from the festival world had shown me her tarot deck as a way to set an intention for a day of adventuring. We'd pull a card from the deck, look up the meaning in her worn little guidebook, and use it as a kind of prompt as we left our camp in search of fun and wonderment. I figured that maybe a deck like that could help me get through the hellish adventure of living through a pandemic with no job security. I started to shop around for a beginner's deck. The most common deck for tarot is called the Rider Weight deck. It consists of 78 cards that each has a different meaning that can change depending on a bunch of different factors. Between all 78 cards, you basically have an image or a series of images that can represent any kind of person you might meet in life and every kind of feeling you might experience. Like the devil, which represents primal instincts and desire, or the sun, which embodies light and joy. The way you ask the cards to tell you about your future is by laying out a spread where each position in the spread deals with a different facet of what's to come. But before I made the mistake of actually purchasing a deck, I learned that there's a superstition about tarot cards, one that says you're not supposed to buy yourself your first deck. It has to be a gift. Now, I'm a generally rational, scientifically-minded human. I was pretty sure that was bullshit. But did I really want to start up an arcane practice with a big fuck you to tradition? Maybe not. So I post a request on Facebook, and eventually a secondhand deck showed up on my porch, wrapped in a lovely velvet bag. Sitting on the floor of my little studio apartment, I looked through my cards the way an illiterate child might flip through the pages of an encyclopedia. The pictures were pretty, but I had no idea what they meant. I bought a Kindle book, downloaded a couple of printable quick guides, and found a tarot flashcard app for my iPhone. Every day for a week, I moved from my desk, where I worked my nine to five, to the floor where I took my lunch breaks. I had all of my study materials laid out around me so that I could carefully memorize every card. I started to see patterns in the numbers, like how tens often mean the completion of the cycle. I started to think of the face cards as people in my life. The Queen of Cups, whose divine female energy guides matters of the heart, was my paternal grandmother, who was the most loving woman I've ever met. The cards became familiar. But I still had nuts and bolts questions about how to interpret the rudimentary spreads I've been practicing. I got on Facebook, looking for a community of people who were interested in talking shop about mastering readings for myself and others. And boy, there were some folks who wanted to give all kinds of advice. You must clear your mind so that spirit can speak to you clearly. Try lighting a votive candle or washing your cards with the light of a full moon. It seemed to be exclusively women, though they were diverse in age. There were plenty of people in their 20s, like me, but others were old enough to have teenage children who were getting curious about mommy's energy trading cards, as one child put it. The Facebook moms would go on and on about stuff like, you should never ask spirit about the personal lives of other people because it's disrespectful to their privacy, and spirit might turn against you and tell you lies. How exactly... Can you tell if a deck is lying to you? I wondered. Spirit can be tricky. The more you use your cards, the stronger your relationship with spirit will become, the diviners on the internet advised. I scoffed at most of this. I don't even believe in God, much less a higher power named spirit that might be interested in lying to me in a card game. It seemed like the upside down version of the little old Christian ladies who used to pray for my soul. It all felt so wrong. A year ago, I was in the lab trying to make the world a better place by rigorously testing my hypotheses using glassware and reagents. Now I'm a writer, trying to make myself feel less alone with parlor trick magic. But something about the cards spoke to me. For as much as I'm a scientist, if not because I'm a scientist, I love finding patterns in the world around me. 
I love that Tarot, over hundreds of years in the hands of witches and spiritualists and whatnot, has managed to condense so much of what it means to be human into a physical object that fits in my hand. I was fascinated by the potential that my little deck had to help me make sense of all the chaos around me. It's like a self-guided therapy game that allows me to have a conversation with myself, except the productive kind, where I learn how to solve my own problems. I knew enough about science to know that my brain can find meaning in the abstract. I figured that reading a tarot spread was kind of like a DIY Rorschach test, a useful tool for helping me learn about my, more about myself. And if that was the case, I wanted to find more pictures to play with. That's when I found a little Instagram account called Indie Deck Review. Indie Deck Review reviews tarot decks published by independent artists. Most of these artists use the basic meanings from a Rider Waite deck, but make them their own by interpreting the art based on a particular mythology or just using their own lives. The decks are gorgeous. They weren't just a deck of cards. They were 78 meticulously illustrated pieces of art that illuminated the human experience. Some were black and white with luxurious gold details. Others were deliriously technicolor, the tarot card version of staying up all night on drugs. Pages and pages of these decks were linked to an Etsy account or a little shop's webpage where you could buy them from anywhere from $20 to $80 a pop. If you were lucky, a deck was still being funded on Kickstarter, so you could get in with an early bird price. These artists made these decks their own. They broke through the rigidity of traditional tarot lore and put a modern twist on how tarot can help people like me process complex feelings through the joy of the art and the introspective practice of self-care. My small chunk of surplus income was quickly spent on Etsy shipping costs. I bought a cat tarot deck, a nature tarot deck, the simplicity tarot deck where the meanings are written right on the cards. At one point in the summer, I had so many packages coming my way that I couldn't remember exactly what I'd ordered or how many decks I was expecting. I made myself a little shelf to store them all. The empty one, left behind by all of my chemistry textbooks. I'm not a scientist anymore. Not a practicing one, at least. But every time I felt anxiety about my future or nostalgic about my past, I'd pick out one of my decks off the shelf and sit down for a reading. What do I need to know today? I'd ask my cards. Seven of Pentacles. You have sown the seeds of your future and you must be patient as your crops come ready to harvest. It's still uncertain what exactly you will reap, but you must let your projects grow at their own pace if you ever hope to find out. But what will be the outcome? I'd ask. What lies ahead in my future? The world. You're on a journey to be the person you've always wanted to become. Every step along the way has led you here, and you are now exactly where you're supposed to be. And that was Ari Krieger. Ari has permission from the shaman to tell that story and show the photos. Please keep the arts alive in San Diego and donate today. You can do that at the virtual door, or you can become a member of So Say We All for as little as $8 a month. Please go to so sosayweallonline.com and please become a member today. Our next map is November 19th, and the theme is... <laughs> <laughs> Bring it up the rear. I have it written down, too. I'm staring at it. Okay. Our next map is November 19th, and the theme is Bringing Up the Rear. Submission deadline is this Sunday, November 1st. Please get your stories in. We really want to hear from you, and we'd love to see you next month. Next, also long story short, is going to be November 5th. It's going to be at 7 p.m. The theme will be Sibling Rivalry. Please, please also take part in that and check our Facebook for more details. And a final thank you for all of our performers. Leon Deckelbaum, Lynn Cooper, Kevin Manley, Tim West, Woo! Brent Hanafy, Ariana Krieger, and Ariana Remmel. Thank you so much. Thank you for the lovely performance, and we hope to see you next month. Have a good night.